Hello and welcome! In the coming moments, you are about to hear a message that will unpack the truth from the Word of God and move you towards God's purpose for your life. Good morning, Bethesda family, and to all our digital audience. Thank you so much for tuning in to this Sunday morning broadcast. I am excited that you are able to connect with us in fellowship in the comfort of your homes. This morning, Pastor Sam is going to continue with an ongoing transformational message titled, The Evolution of a Butterfly. This message addresses one of the most important and fundamental goals of the Christian life. And that is why I want you to grab your Bibles at this time and join us in this important discourse. And do not forget, I'll be back to share a few announcements with you. Don't go anywhere. Watch this. Good morning once again. It is such a joy and a pleasure to share the Word of God uh, with all of you this morning. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When as we approach God's word at this time in this series, I just want to remind you, God promised in his word, he said, so shall my word be that proceeds out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I have sent it to do and it will prosper in the thing in which I have spoken into. I want to encourage you But as you continue to commit yourself to listening to God's word and doing God's word, the Bible says you will be blessed in your doing. So God is going to fulfill his word in our lives. So we are going to continue with this wonderful series. I believe you have been enjoying it. You've been learning from it. And uh, we are just going to continue in part five. You remember last week, uh, the recording was somehow Uh, stopped when I was talking about the inside job. And the reason why it was somehow abruptly stopped is because I was already overlapping into this particular aspect of the development of this beautiful creature, the moth or the butterfly. Now, it was important that we stop it there so that we can treat this particular aspect on its own. It deserves that a, a separate treatment because Last week we spoke about how the caterpillar or the lover spins itself into a cocoon. And I spoke about where that silk uh, cocoon comes from, how long it is and how that applies into, uh, in our lives. And I don't want to go back into that. Suffice for me just to emphasize that what you say with your mouth is so critical. You remember I quoted the scripture In the book of Isaiah, I quoted the scripture in the book of Psalms about the heritage of the servants of the Lord or the honor that God has given to us. And so it is very important that we understand that our words, they carry power. In fact, when you speak words, you have two witnesses that are listening, the heavens and the earth. They are witnesses that cause the words that you speak to come to pass. And therefore, you cannot take that lightly. So we are going to continue. Now we have understood how the caterpillar has woven itself into this silk. Uh, It's also called a chrysalis uh, because of its golden thread inside. If you look at the pictures of the butterfly, maybe if you Google it or the development of a butterfly, you will see actually there's so many of those kind of pictures where it goes into a cocoon and it looks like it's something that is hanging oftentimes under a branch of a tree, and that is called a cocoon or a chrysalis. That is where the transformation now takes place. Now, we are going to look, and in fact, I've subtitled this message, The Inside Job. What happens inside the cocoon once it has gone in? This is so interesting. Hence, I said last week, you could actually even term this whole process of transformation and the evolution of a butterfly you could even term it the mystery of transformation. There's something so mysterious that as I explain the inside job and you're you're careful and you're listening, 
you're going to be able to not only enjoy, but you're going to hunger and thirst after the word of God and hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you're going to see just the miracle that God has woven in the power of his word. Now we're going to deal with how then does that caterpillar, we know it went in there as a worm, and how does it turn into a butterfly? Now, one of the things that I have discovered in my study, I found that the caterpillar, or what is scientifically termed a lover, it's the same thing. That you remember, I spoke about the fact that it stuffs itself with leaves, it grows plumper, it grows longer, and through a series of molds, because it keeps molting and it sheds its skin, all of that are lessons about the effect of God's word. You see, sometimes you find certain believers, they end up becoming cynical. They say they cannot change or, or they cannot experience a transformation is because you're trying to do it through what I would call maybe self-help. No, the more you ingest God's word, the more you take in God's word, as you will see in just a moment, there are things that will begin to peel off. That's why the psalmist say, your word in Psalms 119, I believe verse 11, it says, your word I have hidden in my heart. The word to hide, it's actually not to hide it, but it seems in the Hebrew, it means I have prized it. I have elevated. It says, your word I have hidden in my heart so that I will not sin against you. So the proportion of your sinning is directly related to your intake of God's word. If you find yourself habitually tripping and sinning and, 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 and going around the same block and going around the same situation for a long time, stop focusing on fixing the sin problem. Start focusing on the proportion of the word that you take in. Notice it says, your word I have hidden in my heart I have priced it, I've elevated it in my heart so that I will not sin against you. So what happens with this uh, caterpillar, the more it stuffs itself with the leaves, which I will compare it to the word of God, what it does, it, it molds, it sheds its skin. So your behavior, your consciousness, your thinking, your walk, the way you conduct yourself, the way you speak, will be changed automatically by your intake of God's word. And I said one day it stops eating, it hangs upside down from a twig or a leaf and it spins itself into a cocoon. Now this is what happens inside the cocoon. Within this casing, within this chrysalis, within this cocoon, the caterpillar, hear this now, it radically transforms its body. So I want you to get ready for a radical change. I know you may have said, well, I will always be like this. I will talk like this. I will end like this. I will live like this. But there's something that God wants us to understand about this particular insect. Think about what I've been making, the comparisons I've been making all this while. I mean, think about how this worm just keeps crawling. And think about a butterfly to think that that butterfly emerged from the same crawling, gooey, and slow-moving animal to something that flies. That's why I say you must get ready for a radical transformation, which is going to eventually emerge as a butterfly. But what, let's start by us addressing this question. What does that radical transformation entail? Now, this is going to take us to become true to our text. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse number 18, it emphasizes this truth. Remember when I started in part one, I emphasized the combination or the working of the word of God and the Holy Spirit in bringing about a transformation. Now, let me read it in your hearing. In the Amplified Bible, it says, and all of us, no one must be left behind. All of us with an unveiled face because we continue to behold in the word of God. Notice what do we behold? We behold in the word of God as in a mirror. You remember James tells us that the word of God is compared to a mirror. I mean, when you hold a mirror in front of you, what do you do? You gaze at it. You don't look 
on the side of it. You look at it because the mirror is going to reflect the image. Notice what image are we looking at as we gaze into the mirror. It says we continue to behold. That's something that we do continuously. As in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are constantly being transfigured. We are constantly being metamorphosized into his very own image in ever increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. Let me say this. The whole process of metamorphosis is to get you to get your glory back. That's what Paul speaks about in the book of Romans. He says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The whole process of transformation is going to get you to live in your glory. And when I get to the end of this series, you're going to see the wonderful work. It's amazing how that without the butterfly, even the ecosystem will be disturbed. God has called you because what the butterfly does, there's a function. I'm going to describe this at the end, how that it cross-pollinates even certain flowers that would not be able to meet with each other. See, God has called you to cross-pollinate. He has called you to cause things that would never be able to meet with each other to achieve a greater purpose and balance in life. Now, how does a caterpillar rearrange itself? I don't want to lose this thought. How does it rearrange itself inside this particular, in, in this cocoon? What happens inside this chrysalis or cocoon? Number one, the caterpillar, hear this now, it digests itself. It digests itself releasing enzymes to dissolve, to disintegrate all of its tissues. So what it does, remember, it used what it ate to build a cocoon. Now further, once it's inside the cocoon, there are enzymes that it's going to release and those enzymes that it releases or it releases, they are going to digest that whole worm. And that digestion takes, it takes the form of total disintegration of, excuse me, of all its tissues. Now look at this here. You see, entomologists, they describe this as a process where it digests itself. But when we look at scripture, I want you to understand that it's not you as such digesting itself. That is now the work of God. That is the work of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the word that you have taken in. Why am I saying that? Philippians chapter 2. It says, therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed, Philippians 2 verse number 12, my suggestion, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you show in my presence, but much more because I am absent. This is what happens inside. Work out. Notice it doesn't say work for, it says work out. So you can only work out what has already been worked in. What has been worked in is what you took in. It's more like an input and an output. You can only work out what has already been working. Now, look at this. It says, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, self-distrust, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. Notice, like I said again, you work out what God has worked in because when you look at verse number 13 of that Philippians 2, it says, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while at work in you. Notice, it is God who is all the while at work in you, energizing, 
and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Now, in this series, I believe we have been reading a couple of scriptures that I have said to you, it looks like they are written in reverse. Because when you look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, I believe you will agree with me that verse number 13 actually explains what is happening before verse number 12. Why am I saying that? Let's start reading from verse number 13. It says, not in your own strength. Come on now. Not in your own strength. And you understand why? I say this whole process of transformation, there's a part you play and there's a part that God plays. And I'm going to emphasize this because those enzymes that cause the whole disintegration inside that cocoon, those elements are what it took in. But the agent that works that process is God. Notice he says, not in your own strength. And sometimes you find believers, they become frustrated. I'm trying to live holy. I'm trying to live clean. And every time you try to live holy, you try to live clean, you mess up. You try to live holy, you try to live clean, you mess up. Then you become discouraged. All of us go through those kind of processes. But I want you to understand that you need to yield yourself to the one who is going to work that process in you. Notice here, it says, not in your own strength. I want to emphasize that. Not in your own own strength, not through your own self-help. It says, for it is God. See, it starts in the negative, then it shows you the positive. For it is God who is all the while effectually, look at that word, effectually, efficacy. God is efficacious in your life. Who is at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire. That means for you to say, well, I love God and you want to live a life of power, a life of just, you know, doing exploits for God, even as this year is a year of divine order and great exploits. Those exploits, if you remember when we started this year, I did explain that the great exploits are done through the agency and the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see as we go along that you will never underestimate disregard what he wants to do in your life. It says, who is effectually at work in you, energizing and creating. Remember, as it disintegrates, it becomes now formless. Takes us back to that scripture I read in the book of Genesis chapter number one. The Bible says the earth became formless. And when God spoke the word, when God released the word into that situation, the Holy Spirit came to be, to do a creative or a recreative process in our lives. Now, can I go a little bit ahead of myself? Because that's what I've placed at the end of this particular part. Do you understand why the Bible says don't grieve him? Do you understand why the Bible says don't quench him? Because when you quench him, when you grieve him, you're not only sabotaging how you're going to emerge, but you are stunting him and you're actually forbidding him from doing the the creative work of making you to emerge as a unique butterfly. Now it says here, he energized and he created, creates in you the power and the desire. Oh, I love that. Because in and of our own self, we don't really desire to serve God. We don't really love God. We don't really you know, desire to even praise him and to live because David says, I was shapen in iniquity. And so for us to be able, that's why John says, it's not that we love God, but it is God who loved us. So when you say, I love you, God, it's not in and of yourself. It's your response to a revelation of how much he loves you. I wanted to hear, to get that very clear. So it says, he creates in you. I love the way the Amplified put He energizes you. He creates in you the power and the desire both to will. You just wake up having a desire to walk in love. You wake up and having the desire to do business. You have a desire to, 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 to advance in your career. You have a desire to love your wife. You have a desire to love the brethren. You have a desire to serve God's people. You have a desire to bring God's kingdom to bear. That's why the Bible says, turn us, O God, and we shall be turned. So God is the one that starts the work. God is the one 
God is the initiator in this whole process. And that's why I'm reading verse 13 first. He says, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Then you go to verse number 12. It says, then you work out. So I want you to notice here, because I've spent a considerable amount of time here. God is the one that starts because he worked in you. And then you go to verse number 12. Then you work out. Because if you look at that word, actually, in the Greek, kata egazomai, it, to kata egazomai, that's the word work out. You can, it means to bring something to completion that has already been worked in. Now, I want to bring out a, another scripture about explaining this whole disintegration process. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 21, it says, Assuming that you have already heard him and been taught by him, as all truth is in Jesus, embodied and personified in him. It says, Strip yourself. It's this integration time. Strip yourself of your former nature. Put off and discard your old unrenewed self. Everything that is, I would call the word, you know, that is lava or loverish in you. That still wants to continue crawling. That still continues, wants to stay in carnality. That still wants to continue in your childish state. It says, put off, discard your old unrenewed self, which is characterized by your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that springs from delusion. You have to be willing to allow certain things to be stripped off of your life. And he told you, he says, this is your former nature. You see, when the lover goes in there, it is as it were, hear this now, it is as it were willing to say, I've been crawling all my life and I want to let go of this. I want you to begin to imagine what God wants you to do. Begin to imagine yourself flying. You must not, you see the problem why many of us, we cannot experience transformation is because you find that a lot of us, we want to keep on rehearsing, we store up, we reference our past. And that stuns us and it stops us from experiencing the vision of the future. You see, you must not allow all your past memories. It's amazing that some of you, I mean, when you look into your phone, you still have got pictures and text messages of things that you don't like. No, strip them off your life. Delete them from your life. Delete certain ways of, to of, of talking. Delete the things that are past. You know, the past, you must leave it where it is in the past. And when you leave the past in the past and start to embrace the memory of the future, you'll be able in the present to organize your life for where you're going. So allow the past to be stripped, to disintegrate. Look at verse number uh, 23. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. It simply means having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. You cannot have a fresh and a spiritual mental attitude as long as you are meditating or ruminating on the things that are past, which are taking you nowhere. And it says, verse 24, and put on the new nature. So as it disintegrates, what it's going to do now is going to reintegrate into a new nature. It says the regenerate self, the new man, the butterfly you, I will say that created in God's image in true righteousness and holiness. Now, however, there's something I don't want you to miss. When it disintegrates, I don't want you to miss this. When this lava disintegrates, we are told that certain highly organized groups of cells, which are called imaginal cells, this is interesting, they survive the digestive process or they survive the disintegration process. You see, this is the law of nature. When certain things die, certain things must resurrect. This is the law of nature. And this is how Jesus places it or puts it. In John 12, verse 24, a familiar portion, he says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat, notice it's a grain of wheat, falls to the earth and dies. That's this integration. That's destruction. And dies, it remains just one grain. 
and it never becomes more but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, let me paraphrase that word, if it disintegrates, it produces many others and it yields a rich harvest. Let me just, you know, uh, take that verse and just read it in the way, in the context of this discourse. If the lover is willing to disintegrate, if the cells of the lover are willing to disintegrate, what happens is that as it disintegrates, it's going to produce the butterfly with its features. Because remember, I said, they are highly organized cells. They are called imaginal discs. This, this actually uh, cells. They survive the digestive process. That means as it self-disintegrates, there are cells in there which are going to emerge and which survive. Now, understand there are certain things. This is a statement I want to make. There are certain things inside you which will remain dormant until you mature. You see, because everything that is loverish, that is not needed for it, when it forms and transforms into a butterfly, must totally disintegrate. These imaginal cells, can I just explain them? These imaginal cells which survive, they are what are going to mature into an adult butterfly. This is just the mystery of this animal. They are These discs, they are going to form the eyes of the butterfly. They are going to form the wings of the butterfly. They are going to form its legs. They are going to form its genitals as a butterfly. They are already woven inside this moth. In fact, entomologists, they tell us that these imaginal discs they are there even at the X stage of this butterfly. Can I say this? Whatever God has made you to be is already on the inside of you and it will remain dormant. It will never emerge until you're willing to allow the old nature to disintegrate. And that's why Galatians chapter 4, we are back again at Galatians. It says, now I mean this, as long as the air Let's paraphrase it. As long as the butterfly, it says as long as the air is a child, as long as the air remains a child, as long as the butterfly remains a lover and underage, he does not differ from the slave. As long as the butterfly stays as a worm, it will stay in that particular stage of just foraging the way it used to forage. Although he's the master of all the estate, although it is actually a butterfly, but is under guardians and administrators or trustees until the date fixed by his, fa by, 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 by his father. Now, I don't want you to lose track of why I took you to Galatians. It says the air is a butterfly. Everything that makes the butterfly to be the butterfly is there. It's in what we call imaginal disc or these cells. But all of that remains dormant until there are things that must disintegrate. Because once a caterpillar has disintegrated all of its tissues, except the imaginal discs, those discs that are there, that are remaining, what they do is they use the protein-rich soup, because all the stuff that disintegrates, it becomes like a soup. If you cut it, it will just drip like, you know, like, like a watery substance. Now, those imaginal discs, they use this protein-rich soup all around them to fuel the rapid cell division to form the wings, the antennae, the eyes, and all other features of the adult butterfly. In fact, we are told that it starts, it begins with only 50 cells and then it will increase to more than 50,000 cells by the end of metamorphosis. I want to declare to you that you are about to metamorphosize. And, but it is important that you must understand that there has to be an disintegration of the old condition, the old way of thinking, the old way of talking. And that's why, if you want to understand that 
what God has made you to be, look at what Ephesians is saying. That's number 10. It says, for we are God's own handiwork. We are his workmanship. Recreated. Think about what's happening in there. Because Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3 speaks about your position. So what I'm reading here in Ephesians chapter number 2 speaks about your condition or your position. Position in this case speaks about the fully fledged, fully matured butterfly. Notice here. It says, for we are God's own handiwork, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking parts which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life. Get ready for the good life. Which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now notice here, as this worm keeps crawling and it goes through these stages, on the inside of that worm are imaginal discs. I don't know where you've been crawling for the past, I don't know how many years you've been a believer. You see, you may have been crawling all your life and you look at your surroundings and say, this is where I'm going to be. I came to dispel that whole myth this morning. I came to let you know that on the inside of you, there are imaginal discs. There is an ability to fly. There are wings inside of you. In other words, there is another perspective. There is another dimension of living that God has already woven on the inside of you. The fact that other people do not attain and don't, uh, they don't, experiencing it, they don't realize it does not mean it's not there. It was lying dormant, just like that heir that remains a child. The Bible says, though he is a master, that's his position. He's a master, child of God, you and I are masters. But God places us under different tutors and governors. That's why you must never, you must always learn to submit yourself under people who correct you. Even where I am, it does not matter. There are people that God has placed in my life that correct me. It's terrible to live your life and nobody can correct you. Nobody can help you. There are people in business who have walked the path and God sends them to your life. But when they correct you, when they speak to you and then you get upset, you will miss your opportunity to fly. There are people who are already flying right now. And God is bringing them over around your life, even during this season. And when they correct you, whether spiritually, whether in the area of career, that's why it says that heir gets first place under tutors and governors. For every one of us, there's a tutor spiritually. There's a tutor in the area of education. There's a tutor in the area of business. You must discern those people. You must discover those people. You must embrace those people. You must submit yourself under those people. They are your tutors and governors. Those tutors and governors are not limited just to spiritual tutors, but they are tutors in every field. And you must be willing to humbly sit under them because when you sit under them, they will show you the path. They will show you how you can fly like them. Hallelujah. Now, this is so interesting because the Bible says you are an heir as you are an heir already. Now, getting a look at this metamorphosis as it is, happens, you will realize it's difficult. It's not easy because you must understand that God will use certain instruments to bring about the disintegration. This is what God is going to use to bring about the disintegration in your life. Remember, when we read about a butterfly or about the lover, we, we read that it uses the enzymes. And the enzymes, they come from what it ate. I said, what do you eat? Jeremiah, your words, I found them and I ate them. The reason why a lot of believers cannot experience total disintegration because there will never be a proper formation if there was no full disintegration. And that's why you find that some believers or some people, they just go half-baked and half-cooked. 
And if you are not fully, if you have not fully disintegrated, you will not be able to fly. Can you imagine? In fact, I read that, you know, when you disturb that whole process of disintegration and that whole butterfly comes out, it's not able to fly. It's not able to become uh, 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 fully airborne. In fact, entomologists, they call it more like a botched operation. So you must allow the process to be fully completed. Like James would say, let patience have its perfect work. Let me tell you what happens inside that cocoon. It's a product. You must become a product of patience. Let patience have its perfect work so that you will be complete. Come on now. And entire, lacking nothing. In other words, nothing missing in your ability to handle what God is about to give to you. Look at this now. These are the things that bring about the in, in disintegration quickly. Hebrews chapter number four. It's two things. It's the word of God and it's the Holy Spirit. Now, you know the scripture, Hebrews four. It says, for the word that God speaks is alive, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. I want you to see what I just read earlier about the Holy Spirit being the one or God being the one that energizes. You remember what I read in Philippians chapter two, verse 13. Look at the effect. It says, there it says, it is God that energizes you, that creates. And here it says, the word that God speaks is alive, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. Now, here it tells us about God's word. Now it's going to use a comparison. It says, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. This is what we call a disproportionate comparison. It doesn't say the word of God is like a two-edged sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, there is nothing that can be compared to it. it the, the, the writer of this verse just says, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, think about what I'm talking about, what's happening inside the cocoon. For stuff to become totally disintegrated, all the carnality, all the fear, all the timidity, all the lack of confidence, all the old mindset, everything must be placed under something that is sharper than any two-edged sword. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Look what it does. It penetrates to the dividing line of the breath of life, that is the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing. See, that's what happens during the disintegration. It's as if the word of God is like, you know, sharper than any two-edged sword. I could compare it to a laser beam that can cut. It is able to cut off the old nature, the stuff that is clinging on to you, keeping you bound, keeping you fearful, keeping you crawling, keeping you in a carnal state. But you must, it says sharper than exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Verse 13 says, And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed and naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what does this mean? See, when you and I submit ourselves under not a blunt knife, but a word that is sharp, a word that will cut, it will disintegrate things that are not needed in your life. See, that is the work of God's word. And that's why this is not the only scripture that compares the word of God to a sword. Ephesians chapter number six, uh, verse number 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Notice that sword of the spirit actually explains two things. It says the sword of the spirit. The sword is the word and of the Holy Spirit. That means when the word of God is wielded, when the word of God is spoken, when the word of God is applied on every situation, what it does is it cuts off, it analyzes, it disintegrates something, things that are not supposed to be there, but what is supposed to be there will stay. And here is another scripture. So Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 6, they speak about the word. Romans chapter 8, verse number 13, it tells you now what Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 6 were saying. 
It says in Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will die. If you live like a lover, you will stay like that. Remember, a lover is easily prone to predators because whilst it's foraging, there are birds that eat worms. They will just come and snap it like that because it's slower to respond. And if you're a believer and you feel like the enemy takes advantage of you, you need to understand that you need to spin yourself into a cocoon. You need to follow the stages of the development of the butterfly. Now, notice something here. I don't want you to miss this, but the Romans 8 verse 13 in the Amplified Version, it says, but if through the power of the Holy Spirit, there we spoke about, for the word of God speaks is alive, full of power. Here we see, but if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death, destroy certain things. Let them disintegrate. Look what he says. These are the things that must disintegrate out of your life. You are habitually putting to death, making extinct. Everything loverish must be made extinct. Deadening. The evil deeds prompted by the body. You shall really and genuinely live forever. Do you see the oxymoron? While some things are dying, there are things that will emerge. Let me say this, there is a life that God has determined for us as his people, but we can only experience that life. We can only experience that level of glory if we allow certain things to disintegrate, if we allow certain things to die. But the problem is that sometimes when you see things disintegrating in your life, sometimes this is the mistake you do. You view things from a negative light. Oh, this is dying. Oh, that is dying. Oh, that is dying. No, there are certain things that you must allow to totally disintegrate. Oh, I don't have time. You see, Ruth was willing to allow Moab to die. Ruth was willing all her past memories of Moab to die. And she started to embrace the vision of Bethlehem. That's why she said to Naomi, I will follow you. You see, some of you, you need to disallow certain environments that do not speak well of your life, that do not speak good of your future. Allow them to die. Ruth was willing to leave Orpah. And here Ruth proceeds to Bethlehem, not knowing that she was going to be met by a kingsman redeemer, Boaz. And as I speak right now, I want to prophetically declare that stop crying of things that you used to hold very dear. Allow certain things to totally disintegrate. Allow certain associations to die. The problem is that sometimes you think it's the devil that's causing certain things to disintegrate because you are used to them all your life, but you must allow them to die so that you can know certain things by the Spirit. And I want to say this. It says, allow dead end things so that you can live forever. There is a life that God wants you to experience. See, for, before God can build and plant, you must have an end-to-end perspective. That's why he said to Jeremiah. He says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 10, he says, Today, in the God's Word translation, I've put my words in your mouth. I've put you in charge of nations, of kingdoms. To, he says, you will uproot, you will tear down, you will destroy, you will overthrow, you will build, and plant. Now, I want you to understand when you look at that scripture and you are not aware that there is an order before a new life can appear, before you can emerge as a butterfly, there are certain things. The problem is we want to build on things that God wants to destroy. We want to build new experiences on things that God wants them to disintegrate out of your life. Notice, he says, This is the order. First, you must uproot. Then you must tear down. Then you must destroy. Then you must overthrow. Look how it culminates. Then you can build and plant. And I want you, as I close, to emphasize this, that true transformation, or rather a radical transformation, can only be realized when you are willing to let go of the way you used to reason, the way you used to think. And someone may say, well, how am I going to develop that? You see, you must learn to embrace the new. You must learn to embrace the people that God brings into your life. You must embrace even something that you are not used to. 
And the reason why some of us become stunted, it is because you are not willing to embrace. Can you imagine telling a lover that, you know, one day you're going to fly. He says, me fly, where are the wings? Me, no. See, one of the ways, which is the simplest way for you to experience that life, there's a scripture in Proverbs. It says, when you walk with the wise, you will become wise. I mean, that's like a given. That's like a blank check. You may not be wise, but your associations with the wise people, it makes you wise. It makes you smarter. In other words, you don't even, they paid the school fees for you, but your association with them will make what they have to rub off on you. And I want you to understand that God wants you to experience that transformation. God wants you to experience that true metamorphosis. And I want to close with this particular scripture because this is very important and then I will be done. You see why you must not quench and why you must not grieve the Holy Spirit. It is because, I'm closing with this, He is the one that has the blueprint of your total transformation. He's the one that is going to make your life become so colorful. He's the one that is going to make you to realize the real you without copying anybody. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and this is going to be my closing scripture, and I believe you have been blessed. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, it says, <clears throat> I had not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I just want to read it in the New King James Version here. It says, I had not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has already prepared for those who love him. These are what I will call the imaginal discs. They are already there. They are already prepared. It lines up with Ephesians 2 verse number 10. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has already prepared. They are already woven in you. I think if there's anything that should really make you to become angry is to realize that as you are walking, as you are listening right now, as you are living your life as a believer, the imaginal discs are on the inside of you. The imaginal discs of the real you. Because remember I said, what, what are the imaginal discs? They are what forms the butterfly, the legs, the eyes, the wings. They are already there, but they remain dormant. They can never be realized until you allow certain things to disintegrate. Let me read this verse. It says, the things which God has prepared, notice the tense, they're already there for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. See, there are things about your life. In other words, your file. The blueprint about, you see, when you look at planes, they don't fly at the same level. The Airbus flies maybe at more than 40,000 feet above sea level. And then you've got lighter jets that fly at about 10,000 feet. See, the level of your flight, the level of your glory, the level of your exaltation, the levels of your blessings are woven in the Holy Spirit. And that's why you need to understand that when you quench him, you are really actually shutting him off from revealing the level of your glory. That's why the Bible says, we look as we continue to behold, we are being transformed from one level of glory to another level of glory. The reason, can you imagine if you take a small private jet, you try to fly it at 40,000 feet? You'll never achieve that. In fact, I believe you will somehow sabotage your flight journey because it does not have the engine capacity to get to that. 
And so every one of us listening to this word, God has wired you to fly at higher altitudes or at different altitudes. And the reason why some people, they become frustrated is because you try to compare yourself with another person's flight journey or flight levels or blessing level or glory level. God says, there are some of you I've wired you. I mean, you can fly in a small private jet to different destination or a Gulf Stream to different levels. But God is the one through the Holy Spirit who will reveal to you your level of glory. That's why it says, for what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God, nobody knows the things of God. Can I paraphrase it? No one knows the things of God concerning you except the Spirit of God. You will never underestimate His work and what He wants to accomplish in your life in bringing you out into that level of glory when you understand that He's the one that has your blueprint and that He's the one that has your fire. So don't quench him and don't grieve him. And as we conclude this message next week, can I leave you with this term? It's a new term I found. I'm not sure maybe you know it. I want you to get ready to experience what is called an eclosion. Word eclosion is spelled E-C-L-O-S-I-O-N. Eclosion. It's a term that is used in entomology, what you're talking about, moths and butterfly. And I just want to tease you with this. Eclosion is the emergence of an adult insect from its pupal stage. I am trusting God, like what I've been sharing all this while, that this word, let it not just take us on a theoretical experience, a theoretical journey, but it should be a journey where you're willing to allow certain things to disintegrate whilst you're in your lockdown stage whilst you're in your cocoon and get ready for an eclosion. God bless you. Thank you for listening in. We hope that this word has uplifted and empowered you and will cause you to become all that God has called you to be. Bethesda Christian Center, empowering kingdom people with kingdom word for kingdom living. For the rest of its life or for the rest of the lives of the congregation. Even today, I'm very happy on behalf of the organization. Even the mask as repellable. Napunyabo, Bwezi, Bobo Bulaya, and then Mudim Asar Blessing. Our elders are still safe, and then Keratolo Hakata, look at this mask because I never pull up over a Kalatona on daily basis. Look at this at the time. So Keratolo Hoka, Kilabo Hela Totochi, Mobu Emumba are a hanging old age home. Kelly. Welcome back, family, and thank you so much for staying throughout this entire message. Now, change is life's most inevitable occurrence. And so, when you refuse to change, there's a great possibility that you might end up in chains. And that is why it is critically important on this life's transformational journey that you become like a child. Because children are constantly evolving and transforming just like a butterfly, from that lava stage to a purple stage and eventually to a butterfly, from a 30-fold 
to a 60-fold, and ultimately to a 100-fold. From the good will of God to the acceptable will, and then to His perfect will. And that is the process of reclaiming the glory that was once lost in the garden. And that is why I want to encourage you today to take ownership of this transformational series of message that you have heard. Because by so doing, you are able to become the full expression of that glory that was once lost in the Garden of Eden. Now, before I go, I want to thank all of you for your generous ongoing support of this ministry with your financial donations. Thank you so much, Bethesda, because without your gifts, we cannot continue to propagate the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and keep the ministry afloat. I also want to thank those of you who have been supporting the Dream Center effort with our food voucher campaign. As a result of your donation, we have been able to assist so many families who are not able to feed themselves at this time. And also reaching out to some of the homes that we're in partnership with, old age homes and women at risk homes, whose you know, lives are at risk at this time. But with your generous support, of your donation, we have been able to reach out and we've blessed these homes with food that can last them for about a month. About a month, yes. That is what your donation has been able to achieve in these homes. Thank you, Bethesda. Now remember that this coming Wednesday, I want you to join me with the First Lady as we continue with this powerful discourse, knowing your spouse by the Spirit. You can't afford to miss what is coming up this week. I look forward to seeing you. God bless you. I love you. Peace and love.